And since we are in Fortaleza, one of the key submarine cable hubs, let's discuss this topic with the experts in the region. Now we're going to start a panel on submarine cables, growth, and regional infrastructure. And to that end, I invite uh, the speakers to join me here. Our aim is to discuss the technical and commercial relations of a, a range of uh, service providers, the current situation of the cables, and their impact on the regional internet infrastructure. The panel is going to be in Spanish and in Portuguese, so we recommend you to use uh, interpretation if you need translation. And for this panel, we'll have the chair, Rosario Mariano, Global Head of Edge Strategy, uh, Rosario, please. Lucenildo Jr., Head of Engineering of Angola Cables. Fabio Monteiro, Sales Manager in Sparkly. Rafael Lozano, National Manager of LLIC in Brazil. Fabio Laguado, Head of Sales and Country Manager U.S. of Ital. Leonardo Almeida, IP Network Administrator in Cyber and Esther Fernandez, Interconnection Strategy Head in Celsius. So welcome you all, Rosario, you have the floor. Good morning. Well, thank you. First, we wanted to thank, in the name of uh, the submarine cable of uh, Brazil and Latin America, we wanted to thank LACNIG for giving us an opportunity to address such an important topic in, uh, in a community that is so important for the submarine cables uh, of Latin America and the Caribbean. This is the second time that uh, the cables community has an opportunity to uh, address the audience in such a representative event. In uh, 2020, during the pandemic, during LACNIC 40, well, uh, some other LACNIC, there was a tutorial on cables. You can visit it in LACNIC 34. And the idea here is uh, for us to debate about an industry that is 170 years old. Even though it's a niche industry, it's an industry that is sort of the uh, framework of the infrastructure of the global internet. So here, we, we want uh, to have a panel. Uh, tw it's going to take an hour 20 with the key uh, players here. Let me thank in the name of uh, LACNIC all the companies that are represented here for accepting this invitation. And the idea is to bring you everything that has to do with uh, the cable industry infrastructure, what we, what we prioritize, uh, and what we imagine for the future of the cable industry and all uh, the infrastructure of the internet. Let me start by bringing something that is important for any nation, the value of the ocean, the territorial waters uh, in exclusive uh, zones is measured based on four points. One is the source of resources, where whether you can uh, operate it for uh, oil, tourism, fishery. The second is transportation, freight transportation, for instance. And the third is the so-called strategic domain, where the country has a control on uh, the exclu the exclusive economic zone, allowing uh, to other countries to use it or not to. And then uh, the exchange of information is usually it's um, uh, ships uh, taking uh, mail some years uh, ago uh, with a telegraph. And the first uh, submarine cable in Brazil connected uh, 
Rio de Janeiro uh, that to a city called Mawa. It was a 15-kilometer cable, and that cable went up to the imperial city, Petropolis, for and this is something very important for all over the world today. The global market of uh, submarine cables transports $15 billion in uh, daily transactions. That's a huge amount that is moved through submarine cables. Global economy, money is transported by cable. For those who believe that uh, the connections are through satellites, satellites are but 2% of the transactions. 98% is through the cables. Today we have 598 uh, uh, um, uh, cable systems that are active or uh, in uh, construction. We. This is an industry that moves many technologies, many markets. We are speaking of uh, information uh, sciences, uh, product management. We speak of the industry of materials, the legal framework. So we have a number of services and industries that support the uh, today's submarine cable uh, infrastructure. Just a quick view. In 2023, we had $4 billion invested in the market. This was a research by Telegeographic that informs a lot about submarine cables with some systems that have been, that were activated in the last two years. The growth of cable the cable market continues to uh, grow and to thrive. Speaking of traffic, uh, well, we have still a lot to do. We see our main hub, the United States is the main hub, and in spite of the fact that we have 16 cable systems, some of which are already obsolete, then we have we have a good infrastructure, but we continue to have a lot of traffic that needs to go to the United States. So let me show the uh, traffic uh, in Brazil and uh, the uh, Latin American markets. The uh, key hubs in the region are Mexico and the United States. Um, mm, but Argentina, Brazil, and Chile are growing. The uh, capacity used in Brazil in 2022 was uh, 74 teras. So, very briefly, just to give you a view, there's a high complexity involved in uh, permits, security, uh, um, uh, for uh, licenses and uh, have rights. In the case of Brazil, we have a regulation that is handled by different uh, entities, uh, the Marina, Alibaba, and Natel. And when we are, and internationally, the cable industry needs to comply with uh, the uh, uh, law that protects the submarine cables industry that is the same applied to the Navy, um, to commercial uh, Navy. And uh, so uh, the International Committee for Protection, the key flaws of uh, the uh, cables are human. Anchors and fishery uh, and others are natural phenomena. Um, uh, in the last two years, we've had examples of both uh, human and uh, natural resources uh, 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 problems. Let me uh, clarify that sharks don't eat any cables. We've had data from uh, 2006 of, from the IPCC that there are no bite shark events. There's no such a thing. The media love to say that sharks uh, eat cables, but it's very difficult for that to happen. Now, speaking of security, I wanted to give you an example of September 11, uh, 2023. The, um, a uh, ship uh, entering uh, the Atlantic uh, in, uh, at the level of Cabo Frio City because uh, of a, a human uh, error cut uh, a gas pipe and two cables of a company that was uh, hired by Petrobras. So this 
we we are vulnerable because these things can happen. There can be human errors, and uh, the industry must protect it. This led to the loss of uh, 10 percent of the telecommunications of the the internet in Brazil. There was an abrupt uh, change in uh, Sirium and Globenet. Globenet had a protection, so they didn't suffer so much, but the pipeline platform could no longer uh, send gas. But see how important Fortaleza is for the world, not just for here, but for the Brazilian internet uh, uh, ecosystem. On August the 7th, 2023, Two important uh, cables uh, broke uh, for the uh, in uh, on the uh, western coast of Africa, and uh, with this problem, not only did we have problems with Africa, it came to Fortaleza through the Saxa cable and say so. Today, not only for Brazilian internet, but Fortaleza became a very important hub for other continents as well. So Africa, or part of Africa, uses Fortaleza for inbound and outbound traffic. That shows how this city, uh, the beach of the future, became so relevant for the global industry of submarine cables. Now, um, just to give you uh, what happens in Lassam, we have 17 systems. Festoon, that is one of the oldest, is almost uh, uh, is obsolete. It's no longer being used. And here, as this talk is going to uh, be posted, you can download the presentation later and look at it. In Latin America, after Ella Link, some cables will be activated and plans such as the Firmina, that's uh, uh, the uh, Google cable that connects uh, Chile, uh, uh, Brazil and Argentina and Uruguay to the, to the United States. And we have Carnival, uh, Submarine, and uh, AMX3, Tikal. There's uh, no certainty about the Humboldt cable that would uh, link Chile with uh, New Zealand and Australia. That one is still pending for uh, uh, confirming the investment uh, to um, link uh, the two continents. The submarine cable still sees Latin America as a very important uh, uh, place uh, for the submarine infrastructure uh, industry. Let me tell you very quickly about a couple of issues that have to do with uh, the economic market for cables. It's the confusion of uh, the uh, addressable market. What's that? For a long time, the, uh, about 10 years ago, the market thought of building cables because they thought that there would be a market, especially of the OTTs, to buy capacity. And those companies invested in the cables on their own eliminating a non-addressable uh, band in the market. So what happened with this? Many of uh, the cable companies that um, uh, don't have a big tech in their investment consortium, they had uh, to uh, deviate their investment uh, to other products uh, to get investment. And the other economic challenge is the actual prices, because the cable is uh, expected to last 25 years. But the, the important thing in a submarine uh, cable is the economic life. So the life cycle for subsea cables is 18 years. So if you have a cable whose cost exceeds what they're going to gain, it's very difficult that that will become a reality and the life cycle will close much earlier compared to the original plan. Now, what are the factors that make a country the subsea cable hub? We have international capacity, data centers, internet exchanges, cloud providers, competitive prices, and legal security. So this is what it makes a country attract attractive to have subsea cables. And the challenges we face for LATAM are points of contact in every country. 
In the federal organizations, we have in Brazil we have an hotel who is a provider. We have to have these points of contacts in order to involve all the community players and also the government. In many countries, and for quite a long time, the subsea cable industry. Uh, they were skeptical about the fishing and environmental situation, but over the past years, for geopolitical reasons, and also these, there were issues regarding the ministries of defense. So today, environmental issues, fishery, and the ministries of defense have a very important view on this topic. What we have seen in recent years uh, is that the following. Whenever I speak about France, when I speak about Egypt, as well as other countries, they have developed policies that are more severe, more severe protection measures for their subsea cables. In the case of Latin America, it is also important to have legal security for the subsea cable industry. In Brazil and in many Latin American countries, the legal framework of the countries does not require one of these, the IRU, as one of the forms for dealing with this. So each cable operator has to develop their own legal framework in order to ensure the propriety uh, nature of these subsea cables. Now, this is basically what I wanted to share with you. And I now would like to give the floor to the representative from Angola Cables so that we can hear about the current situation in their country. Lucenildo Lins from Aquino Jr. Good morning, everyone. So I would very rapidly like to speak about Angola cables and give you an overview of the situation. Unfortunately, we didn't agree on some of the things. There was an inconvenience yesterday, but one of the topics was already discussed of one of the things that I will also be referring to in my presentation. Now, briefly about Angola cables, we are a submarine cable operator that began as an operator focused on the submarine sector in 2009. Currently, it owns three submarine systems in the world. One is 100% of Angola cables, which is SACS, connecting Africa with Brazil. Then we have WOX, which is a consortium, West Africa cable system. This is one that defines the layers. We are one of the major four investors of this consortium together with the South African Vodafone and another one. And the last one, and not least important, is Monet. This is for our region from Sao Paulo to Miami, and this is a consortium with six fiber pairs. Google has two, we have two and Intel also has fibers. These are a bit different. They are focused in a different direction. They have different mechanisms compared to WOX. Our network has submarine cables that cover more than 31,000 kilometers with different associations. We have one with Cape Verde Telecom to operate access to the beaches and also with the Orange Group in order to integrate the West African region. We also have two data centers. One is in Fortaleza and one in Luanda on the Angola end. We have a tier two data center there and a tier three on this side of the sea. And we have 30 POPs in the world for more than 20 countries in the five continents. Now, specifically about the different countries, 
Yes. As Rogelio already mentioned, in, let me say that Angola Cables began its operations in Singapore and then reached Los Angeles, but not crossing the Pacific. It's not that we don't have the capacity to do so, but we followed the longest path. We crossed Africa, Europe, North America, South America. So this is a global operation right now. Now, focusing on submarine cables, very briefly, I let me say that for each cable, we have different technologies and also different moments for implementation from left, from right to left. We have from the most modern one to the oldest one. The Monet is has to Fiber and sack follows the same line, but wax is a compensated cable. The others two are not compensated. The others use um, older technology and are addressed to the bit virtual Bitcoin model that defines the capacity at which it can be used. So when we bring everything together, Together, as well as the land networks, we have a whole set of countries. We operate in Angola and South Africa, in Nigeria, in Brazil, and so on. Now let us go on to the technical part, which I think is interesting because this is a technical forum and it is more meaningful to have more information on the architecture we have and than the market. Now I promise I tried to make this as simple as possible and this thing over here and also to raise the curiosity of everyone, this is how we operate. So. Compared to some of the topologies that have SLS as a that determines the capacity ultimately, both on the Brazilian side and in the US side, our SOTs are not in SLS. So we have photonic, obje photonic objects everywhere. So uh, subsea cable topology will always be related to these centers. As my colleague Rafael might say, we have extensions, and these extensions pose a whole set of challenges. One of the major challenges is to guarantee that I have repeated stages uh, uh, subsea and repeated stations. And the greater the distance, the greater the difficulty. Now, in practice, we managed to simplify the process as a whole. So six or seven years ago, we needed three pairs of transponders to go from Sao Paulo to Miami. Today, we only need one. So this is saving in terms of scale. Uh, this is a 60% savings in terms of electronics. And this is not only for troubleshooting and all the other issues. So we are far more efficient because the cable begins at the data center of the client and finishes in the other data hired by the other client. So we have, there are lots of keys that have to be properly configured. And ultimately, in practice, this provides a lot of more of flexibility and efficiency. And Monet and Sachs specifically already operate like this. And this is even almost fun. And they say, well, give us capacity in Praia Grande. But Praia Grande is just a, a place where it goes through. So we cannot offer that. We don't have that capacity, only in the commercial data centers. Now, let us speak about Rogerio said, but with uh, more information. Now, fortunately, during LACNIC's event, we'll have Doug with us who will be referring to this. And I don't expect to go into the details because he will be far more objective and he has far more insight to speak about this. But these are some of the things I took from the Kentic monitoring platform. This is in Cameroon. And this was prior to the when the cable broke and how it started to stop speaking to its upstream provider. Then we have a Angola provider, Unitel. 
This is the major mobile phone and residential provider. In practice, they are responsible. Uh, 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 and they. Then we also have an operator that participated. Now, speaking about works and technical issues that are worthwhile mentioning, Rosario said that these breaks occur for several reasons. One of the major reasons is a human failures or failures because of anchors as well as other facts. Sometimes there are natural events that contribute to this. One occurred in Africa and affected three cables at the same time. One of, was a French cable, of Orange Telecom, that also goes from South Africa. So the specific effect is a, a turbidity currents. So this is because of the fresh water when it meets salt water. So we have a river, the Congo River, and when there is intensive rainfall or when there is a strong accumulation of water in the river, it goes down at a fast pace. And because this water is denser than seawater, it produces these vortices on the riverbed. So added to that situation, if we have a geographical structure of the seabed, that is like a hole on the seabed, uh, uh, like a concave, uh, he apologizes. This leads to such an intense movement that it almost breaks the cable. This is a sketch I made uh, of the engineering takes place. And I think it was sort of a good explanation of how this affected the wax cable. This is at the entrance of the Congo Canyon, and then we have the seabed. So you can see there was like a valley, like a, a canyon, a 60 degree angle. When the wire went in and then went out. So when this happened, the cable broke, and the three cables went exactly through the same canyon, and the three broke. They suffered from the same effect. Now, this is the engineering part, which is most interesting. How often did this happen? It already happened twice over the past five years. There were two ruptures in the same place and for the same reason. And because engineering evolves and we study these events, the last recovery led to a different idea. We anchored the cable at 3,700 meters depth on the end A and on end Z. As so we produce a number of floats that is produced with different gases so that don't go don't rise so much but ultimately they produce a sort of bridge so that the cable does not fall into this canyon to this valley because this natural effect will continue to occur we will still have rainfall rainfall and this will continue to occur so this is just to give you an idea in practice the recovery of the cable had to go through structures such as these with these floats then that then generated that type of protection. Now, what occurred in fact when this broke, I looked at the operator Unitel. During the rupture, it lost the two upstreams, which is what I showed you before. So everything uh, was uh, getting to us through the uh, layer one uh, uh, providers via Fortaleza. Now, um, Rogerio mentioned the situation during the event when the three cables broke. I think that that will be discussed later by another speaker. Countries like Namibia, Congo, Angola, and a part of South Africa had uh, to had uh, to, they had to be rerouted 100 percent their uh, traffic to the via the United States, and those that could not be done, uh, they went uh, through South Africa. And uh, going all, all along the western South African coast. And at the same time, they had uh, cloud nodes in Brazilian territory, even in Sao Paulo, that uh, ended up uh, being fed by the topology of Fortaleza. So the level of importance of Fortaleza today is not uh, merely 
um, the fact that it's in Latin America, because uh, that's what happened. This became a bit more technical, but here we are. Thank you. Now I'd like to call Leonardo. Thank you. The presentation Seaborn. So, I'm Leonardo Almeida, and I work in Seaborn, a submarine cable operator, and we are an operator that projected, built, and operates its own cable. Um, we have all that knowledge that uh, came from uh, all uh, we take leverage on uh, the uh, all the knowledge of the previous construction of other cables and we use that technology to maintain our own cable so and it's very important to speak of the support of uh, this uh, company it belongs to partners group uh, and uh, we support uh, Oh, we have a 13786 uh, support. Uh, that's one of the most important uh, traffic providers in uh, Brazil for traffic. Uh, uh, and it expands to the rest of South America. It's a young operator with a new cable. We still have a uh, long longevity ahead. And we built a submarine cable system that can be expanded. So we have five units that um, still allow for expansion to other points. And not only do we uh, provide to our markets, but we can also we also have the potential to provide to new uh, uh, markets. We are building a new cable for the Bermudas Islands. The company is Connecting uh, is uh, investing to connect uh, Bermudas with the closest branch unit. There are others, that, um, that even Fortaleza is a region that is being considered by the company for fu future expansion. But not only do we have our own cable, that is uh, the Seaborn uh, cable uh, goes from Sao Paulo to uh, New York, the Seabrass goes from Sao Paulo to uh, the United States for a lower latency service. That's everything that you will share. It really makes a difference when you're working in the financial market for because a millisecond could imply it all in terms of business. So the cable has uh, to address that challenge to be as quick as possible with communication. But that's not the only thing. We also have the AMX of America Mobile. That's a cable where we have a fibers for that communication too and uh, we all, that's with Jacksonville and we also have uh, from Rio de Janeiro to Miami we understand that the company needs to provide a competitive uh, needs to have a competitive edge for the market not just limited to cables that's a very interesting thing I haven't been in Seaburn for too long but I discovered in the company and I think that this is important that the company is not limited to its own tables cables but they want to offer the best for their services always looking for the best of the rest of the cables to offer a service that will uh, gather the best thing of all the cables. So we create strategic uh, partnerships with our colleagues here. And the idea of having other cables such as Monet um, and uh, the idea and SA, um, the idea is to make the most of uh, each cable to offer a best service and to provide service to uh, the um, uh, cities and towns there, Fortaleza, Salvador, Brazil, Rio de Janeiro, Miami, New York, Santiago, all those cities that you see uh, on the map. 
all that infrastructure is used to uh, support services that make sense for the market demand. Oh, I work directly with the IP transit service. With well, the company invested a lot with new routing centers, well, and there we put our core router Sao Paulo Real Fortaleza for 400 giga interface equipment to have customers with that type of capacity and demand. It's an operator that offers multi-peering services and remote peering. And it makes sense because if you have a lower latency cable, you can give provide remote peering services with a lower latency and with the and that services and uh, co-location are other services we provide. I don't want to uh, go on uh, too long with this because there are other speakers, but I thought it would be interesting to share this. Seaburn uh, has this uh, mentality of strategic partnership, but we have a different uh, mindset because we try to offer quality and services to our customers. Thank you. Now I'm going to call Fabio, Fabio Monteiro of Sparkle. Thank you, Fabio. Good morning, everyone. I'm Fabio Monteiro. I work in Sparkle. What is Sparkle? Sparkle is a company that belongs to Telecom Italia that is responsible for the inter for international global networks. We provide global services with direct presence in four continents, a high capacity network, and we offer multiple services through that network. So IP capacity, uh, DC, uh, IOT, voice, roaming, co-location, SD-1, uh, data centers. Basically, we offer our clients a high availability network. So here you see the Latin American backbone. This is the current backbone. We've been replacing the cables. The oldest cables have been replaced, and we've been putting uh, cables in parallel. Let me show. Here we have the Pacific Ocean, Ocean. and uh, with Curie in the Atlantic, uh, Monet, and uh, Seabrass. So we linked the Atlantic and the Pacific Oceans in different in uh, many points in uh, the United States. Curie specifically, uh, we opened uh, the uh, drop of Curie in uh, the Curie drop in Panama, connecting Panama and Latin America. And let me tell you why. This is Sparkle's new investment in Latin America. We just built a data center in Panama. And what it does is it gives the possibility of crossing the Atlantic and Pacific, North and South, and our idea is to turn Panama into a new international hub. In this uh, data center, we have a, a capacity of 650 racks in five modules and a tier three. In the Atlantic side, we have Seabrass, Seabrass one that uh, contributes with resiliency and uh, Monet that uh, um, contacts uh, Sao Paulo Fortaleza and Miami. And it's very important because in the past we had an event that uh, was a hurricane that uh, severely damaged our operations in the Caribbean. And Seabrass is really uh, exempt uh, of hurricanes. It, it is not in that uh, route. So it's very important to ensure some resilience. And this is an idea of the services we provide. 
of an IP backbone. I'm going to explain what that is. As Roger, you mentioned, we have a submarine. We had a submarine uh, cut in one of our cables, but that didn't damage our services because of the resilience that we have both in the Atlantic and the Pacific Oceans. This submarine cut did not have a, uh, much of an impact on Sparkle because of that. So that's basically what I wanted to show you. Thank you. Now let's call Rafael of Ella Link. I'm Rafael Lozano. Um, if if you hear my accent, a funny accent, it's because I'm a Spanish, but I work in Ella Link, and I'm going to speak uh, Portuguese, but I can speak uh, uh, Spanish too. Ella Link is the last cable that we connected in Latin America in recent times. We've operated since 2021. It's the first high capacity cable directly connecting the continents of Latin America and Europe. What does that mean? Well, as our colleagues already mentioned, there are several submarine systems connecting South America and North America, both uh, in the Pacific and the Atlantic. But as was very well mentioned, cable cuts do occur. So Ellerlink appeared because of two initial reasons. The first is to reduce latency between the continents. Um, uh, again, so continents and data centers of Europe, because there's a potential economic gap between two powers that historically were highly connected both culturally from and with, in terms of contents. Of course, that you can think, for instance, of Portugal that has very close relation with uh, Brazil and Spain that has very close relations with the rest of Latin America. We share culture and contents. We then identify that this route was missing. We lacked such a, a round in uh, the uh, global communications uh, landscape. And the second thing was reducing latencies and increasing resilience. Whenever there are cuts, for instance, when there's something breaks, like in Africa, there need to be there needs to be alternatives to make up for that. S today we see that there is a geopolitical war as the two. Uh, with China and the United States. And if something happens with the United States specifically, Latin America is highly dependent on that country in terms of connectivity. There are alternatives with our colleagues in uh, the cables that connect um, uh, South America with Africa, but there's a, a huge volume of traffic between Latin America and Europe. When we reduce latency, what we identify the same services that uh, Latin America is uh, receiving today from North America content, social media streaming, are maintained by uh, North America um, with a latency. You may imagine that if Today, we connect South America with uh, North America in 60 seconds, depending on where you go to take uh, contents from North America and Europe. You, it will take you an additional 60 seconds. But with our services, you connect directly in just 60 milliseconds, Fortaleza and Lisbon. So we reduce the latency of the circuits by 50% of the current latency for streaming and critical operations with operations uh, under 120 milliseconds, there's a huge difference. You can use B2B uh, services, uh, ERP, there's so you that makes a difference. A big economy is a great savings for everyone where you reduce latency. There's just one hop, optimal hop or ideal in the network that we implement. Ideal paths from Fortaleza to Lisbon, Madrid or other points in Europe. From Sao Paulo to Madrid, we have 120 milliseconds. So what does this mean? It means that elements and companies that have the duplicated infrastructures in the two continents for reasons of latency in order to have 
and don't have the possibility to operate, they will now have just one single control point and cybersecurity control in the two continents so that the users don't perceive a lack of speed or latency in the connections. So both in the cloud and in the facilities. Just curiously, out of curiosity, we like to see the way we see the world. Lisbon is at the same distance from Fortaleza compared to Miami. Osborne, which is a place with a high concentration of Latin data centers in North America. So the same services that you consume in North America can also be consumed from Europe with the same quality. Here we have a summary of the latency maps. As I was saying, from Sao Paulo to Madrid, 120 milliseconds, Fortaleza and Lisbon, 65 milliseconds, and so on. So I don't want to take up more time, but when you reduce latency, the network operations become much more secure. Thank you very much. Fabio from Ebital. Good morning, everyone. I have a different accent, so I'm going to speak in Spanish. So thank you, Rafa. And we'll continue practicing these next relaxing exercises. Now, I'd also like to thank Leo, who already <laughs> took up a part of the topics I was going to include in my presentation. So what is happening with us? I think we are all clear as to the fact that Vital arises from the subsea cable company that used to be called Globenet with the land fiber infrastructure we now have in Brazil. So this led to one single company today with differences in the national and international units. Now the change is in the vision of what we want to do. So basically what we want to do is to bring the contents and the end users closer to one another in any part of the world and so that we are all transparent and use chat GPT if you're in Miami, if you're seated here in Fortaleza, and that can be achieved through the combination of many factors such as submarine cables, the data centers. So having the capacity of bringing the entire ecosystem to one single site is the vision we have, and this is what we are providing in the context of our services. If we go on to the next slide, we see here what we have today. Basically, this is the combination of more than 25,000 kilometers of submarine cables. These are redundant cables. In the specific case of Fortaleza, which has been a development hub, we have four submarine cables. Recently, we had a cut, as was mentioned. It was not a shark. It was a freight vessel with an anchor, with, and this vessel did not follow the procedures. Now, fortunately for us, we managed to solve this using another cable, so the interruption was minimum at the moment. Now, as part of what we say, it is essential that all these ecosystems and infrastructures establish clear ways of interacting so that we can protect them, so that ultimately the services we offer are available whenever we need these. Now, together with this submarine network that we have, we also have five data centers. The origin of these data centers was to create interconnection ecosystems to be able to do peerings with the OTTs and the end users. To date, we have two data centers in Barranquilla, two in Fortaleza, one in Rio de Janeiro, and we are building two further data centers. One is a scale data center in Fortaleza. This is a 20 megawatt 
load data center and one additional data center in Porto Alegre. So the idea is that what happened here in Fortaleza is also happening in Porto Alegre. The latency required for services to operate with the required quality require a different type of infrastructure. That is why I decided to build one in Porto Alegre. In addition to that, we have 455,000 kilometers of land fiber in Brazil. We'll express routes between the major city centers and accesses of more than 60 million home passes, HDDC. So the capacity of having the same quality of service in any part of the world. This is an example of what we are building. This is our, is our scale data center in Fortaleza. It already started. We already started with the works. This is already in operation. This is the data center of Fortaleza. This was the very first one. It's four megawatts of capacity. And together with the fiber network that we have there, this provides services to all operators under the same conditions. So we think that neutrality is of most importance so that any fiber operator that complies with the infrastructure requirements and how to provide access can enter in a transparent way and deliver services and provide interconnections with all the already existing operators without any issues, as we already do with many of our friends who are seated here in the panel today. And finally, this is a construction and this is breaking news here. We continue advancing with this project. This will be in operation by 2026. We already started building this. We think this is one further tool so that this ecosystem can continue strengthening the situation in Fortaleza and in Brazil. Thank you. I would now like to ask Esther Fernandez from Telxius. Good morning, everyone. I'm Esther Fernandez, and I'm going to speak in Spanish because I don't speak Portuguese. I work for Telxius. This is a company that provides infrastructure that is focused on the construction of submarine cables. We have this in the Atlantic Ocean, but also in Latin America, because we're part of the Telefonica group. 70% of Telsius belongs to Telefonica. So we have a strong focus in Latin America, and we provide services to the group. And specifically, we are tier one, and we provide trans IP transit services to all the telephone companies in Latin America. Now, before starting, I would like to thank LACNIC for organizing this event and for inviting me to make this presentation and to share this panel with you. My presentation is not a commercial presentation. It's about submarine cables and the submarine cable industry. And the objective is to tell you about what the cables are. As you can see, there are differences between the two maps. On the right, we have the cables that provided services in the year 2000. These were more than 124 compared to those that we have now in 2023, the ones that are already in operation, those that are planned. And these add up to more than 550 submarine cables. As an anecdote, let me mention that the first cable, which was a telegraph cable, was in the English Channel between England and France, and this was in 1850. So this is more than 150 years ago that this type of infrastructure began to be used. Now, nowadays, submarine cables allow us to have digitalization and all the ecosystem we have today allows us to use this 
technology, of course, the internet, but as well as all the digital application that we use in our daily activities. And this is possible thanks to the submarine cable infrastructure, because all the traffic, 99% of all the international traffic is carried through submarine cables. So people who are not in the industry think this goes through air or through satellites, but everything goes through submarine cables. So this shows the infrastructure of a cable. We have the data centers on land, and then we have the anchor stations. Then we have a part that can be buried or not under the seabed, and the rest of the cable, the large amount, amount of cable, is not and uh, buried, but it goes over the surface of the seabed. And like the previous speaker explained, and that is why the uh, subject to any event happening on the seabed or movements in the seabed, this can lead to cuts in the cables. But most of the cases, it breaks near to the coast because there it is not, it is more shallow, and the fishing vessels can then affect these cables. Normally, they break in the first area, and that is why we painted it thicker. That is where the cable is more protected. It is also buried or can also be placed in a duct that goes from the manhole on the beach and to a given distance along from the coast. So this is to avoid problems with the fishing vessels. Here we can see the components of our cable. They are not very thick. Quite the opposite. They are as thick as this. They're not that thick, and they have a coating to protect them from the outside, and in the, in the side, they have the fiber optic fibers. Then they have the energy supply, and what we see in the bottom sketch, sometimes a technique is used to locate it under the seabed. This is one of the techniques that are applied. So here are some curious facts about the submarine cables. They are not very thick. They're not thicker than a water hose. These have been decided for a lifespan of 25 years. And I think we saw in the first slide the number of cables has increased. And one of the relevant thing is the total capacity that one of these cables can support in the case of with Maria, we designed one with eight pairs. Initially, not more pairs could be placed between Europe and United States. The technology didn't allow us to include more pairs because this consumed a lot of power, and that was not possible. And in addition to that, each pair supported 20 terabits. Now we have much higher capacity of terabits and we have been able to increase this further to 28, which is 224. It's 224 terabits per second now on the same cable. So this, although the lifespan of a wire is not so much, it can be used much more in terms of capacity. These are the difference, differences compared to 2018 Telsys' cables to what we have at present. SAM-1 was built by Telsys and goes all around Latin America. And you can see on the screen it goes from Argentina to Chile and then goes through Matane, crosses the continent, goes through the Pacific, Guatemala, and then in the Atlantic, there is an anchor in Fortaleza, and it encompasses all the services. We could provide services to all the countries because, as I mentioned before, we are from the Spanish Telefonica company. In 2023, we built Maria together with Microsoft and Facebook, which is a transatlantic cable. Then we have a Google cable. It has already 12 fiber pairs. With Maria, we had for eight. This was only a difference of two to three years, but thanks to the technological progress, the same distance can be covered with more fiber pairs. As someone was built in the year 2000, its uh, theoretical life, uh, lifespan is about uh, to uh, finish. It uh, theoretically, it is uh, 25 years that they live. We wanted to have the replacement cable, so we built uh, one with America Mobile, and we have Rusa that was built by Tertius. 
and uh, it's oh, we are about to, to start uh, the Cal that is replacing this segment uh, between Guatemala and uh, Florida of uh, SA1. And well, and the other one is a consortium, uh, it's older. And in the Atlantic, Brusa remains in Brazil, and there we are part of other cables to provide coverage to that part. And then here, one of the important things in the industry of submarine cables that Rogelio mentioned at the beginning is that in the past, those were built, the submarine cables were uh, are built uh, and used uh, by uh, telecom uh, industry because we were the only ones who used them. But as the internet grew and uh, among its players, we have the OTTs. This has changed dramatically. So if you look at the chart in the year 2012, most internet traffic was uh, provided by service providers, by carriers, and the OTTs were mostly not involved. At the time, YouTube was starting, Facebook was there, but well, YouTube was there, but it wasn't so popular because the quality was poor. So the, it, it did rebuffering, it would get interrupted, so people didn't like it so much. But as the quality of video streaming improved, the OTTs became much more relevant in the market, and this tendency has changed. And we see the, how the traffic of OTTs has gone up, and now they have uh, almost 70% of the traffic. As a result, they decided to build their own cables because that was one of the challenges that we faced that Rogelio mentioned. So at the beginning, part of the, t of the cables, Microsoft and Facebook didn't want uh, their own cable and they relied on us because we had the, ex the, ex the expertise, but now it's no longer the case. Now they have their own. So, well, it is true that this is a challenge and that we need to see how we approach it. The chart shows you the investment, and one of the routes that they are investing the most is in the transatlantic route, because in the end, they use the cables to transmit data between their own data centers. Although the, most of the traffic seems to be to end users, that's not the case. Most traffic for uh, Google and Facebook build their submarine cables is to exchange uh, traffic between their own uh, data centers. And through uh, and all that is because arti with artificial intelligence and all that uh, traffic will even uh, uh, will soar. And so you have all the cables that are already participating and uh, that are being built by the OTTs. That's all. Thank you all. Thank you. Now we are going to stand the second round. We are a bit short of time. The idea here is to ask each player here of the cable companies, how do you, what do you expect in the future for the cable industry? What are the future challenges? How do you see Latin America and the Caribbean? Uh, you each have three or four minutes to answer. All right. Fortunately, last week, I was in the submarine network center. I, I uh, participated in a panel called Next Generation in the vision of Angola cables and in the most current vision of uh, the submarine cables. Submarine cables need to add more services. Today, we are speaking of transporting uh, more capacity with very coarse uh, fibers for one side of the segment and for the other, an L band of submarine cables. As a matter of fact, to the North American industry that uh, uh, the sub that is commanded, uh, led by Subcom and uh, the Asian uh, want the fiber to have for a course and they want to optimize the transmission in the C band spectrum. But honestly, what I think that adding new services is much simpler than today what we call the smart cable. That is, among the repetitors, we have, we put a network of sensors that can be monetized a little bit differently. Imagine that in a segment, 
in a leg like Monet, where I have uh, 10,800 kilometers. And uh, imagine that if each repeating station that is at, uh, at seven kilometer dis uh, distance and there's a sonar and that sonar operates in that region of the sea. So we can migra see the migration of whales and movement of ships. That's a service that uh, the submarine cable industry can add with um, and uh, in uh, with uh, the existing sensors. Now, the question today is how can we monetize uh, new technologies and how can we provide uh, these uh, service platforms? As the colleague of Telsius uh, pointed out, the key revenues are mostly focused on uh, the uh, OTTs, and that is my view at least. So let's see whether you can give us your uh, give us your uh, view. Well, from the point of view of Seaburn, the importance, the e even strategic, it's a cable that was built and that still can still expand the network, uh, give um, uh, services to other markets, and uh, to meet a demand that needs to be met and must be duly. Uh, approached in the Brazilian market, because in the end, it's in the Brazilian coast. It is there that we see opportunities for growth, and it is there that we see the possibility of strategic partners sitting here in this panel to provide services to the market with another capacity. The purpose of doing it as wholesale uh, is to focus on volume. So we focus not only in cable, but also routing centers that support cable. So, and that is why we use new equipment to uh, cater for the increasing capacity that users ask. So we are going to put a lot of capacity, but we also increase capillarity with the with that project that I mentioned of uh, connections with the Bermuda Islands and some others that are uh, available to expand the network. Fabio, please. Well, I think that I'm going to change my talk and let me talk more of the commercial aspects. I think that the good thing here is to say the following. We have a, a very uh, uh, large investment. We invest a lot on uh, submarine cable, but the truth is that we are constantly being pressed by the markets to lower our cost. Now, if I continue to reduce my costs, how can I include new submarine cables? Because they won't pay. So that's a highly relevant issue for new investments. Now, for opening uh, branches, for the creation of new services, etc. It is because of that pressure of reducing cost, it might be that sooner or later the industry will no longer be feasible, um, not, no longer profitable. So uh, that is a more commercial uh, view of uh, what might happen, but what is really already happening at, uh, at, as we speak. Thank you. Rafael? The the way we see it at Ling, we think that uh, the submarine cables have to go in parallel to the challenges of the markets with new technologies, first of all, with new routes. Uh, because in the land uh, uh, networks are excellent for capillarity, but they have security and resilience uh, uh, problems. And the impact on consumers is uh, uh, a much more frequent. Now, opening new routes, we have to uh, company new challenges uh, that will be brought about by issues like artificial intelligence, both in terms of latency and the national and and the general 
uh, actor on uh, data protection because a lot is being mentioned where is uh, data, but it's going to become increasingly relevant to consider the path taken by the data. So they want to know that my data is uh, in a place that uh, the Brazilian law trusts, not only in Brazil, but also abroad. For instance, in Latin America, we are following much more the European than the American data protection law because the Americans want to have sovereignty on the data. So new routes will be appropriate. We are opening routes. Uh, um, to Europe. We are working to develop new routes in Latin America because we understand that both resilience and security are absolutely critical and they continue to be critical for the future in the market. Fabio? Well, we see many factors that have an impact. In the presentations, they mentioned that 70% of the companies have their own cables. And with and we've, we've heard about ships that cut the cables with the anchors and data centers that uh, change the uh, traffic cat, uh, pattern. So it's no longer a north to south, or the United States to South America model. All that has an impact. And from our point of view, uh, the key things, the key thing is how to optimize the design of infrastructure that we are using, where the best solution will be. Where is it going to be better to put a submarine cable, where to put two land stations, to monetize, as Fabio said, to monetize all the infrastructure that is being installed in the world, trying to guess what those new traffic patterns will be with artificial intelligence. I think that that's one of the greatest challenges that our industry faces today. Yes, one of the greatest challenges that I already mentioned is that the participants in this industry, uh, we, we, we need to work together so that we can continue to build cables in all the routes that are needed because it's very costly. It's, it's very, and it, it's, it's we're business, so it has to be profitable. And then we have environmental challenges because there are many issues with uh, the coasts and that needs to be considered. You can't always uh, place a cable where you'd like and that could be challenging if you want uh, to tether the cable in areas that uh, are environmentally sensitive and they are geopolitical issues because um, in our case, for instance, in the case of Telsius, we were thinking of uh, establishing cables with Asia, but the United States has already stopped many cables uh, from uh, the United States and China because of political issues. So there were many things that need to be uh, considered when you build a cable. So, and uh, for instance, ensuring redundancy covering the same route with several cables. That's very important and to uh, meet the demands. Leonardo? Yes, there's no doubt that the submarine industry was always uh, vanguard. In the last 10 years, uh, the uh, submarine cable industry developed many functions for the uh, market itself. Let me give three examples. One, has to do with smart cables and that is something that saves lives and why because today the control um, or for instance if we're thinking of tsunamis around the world this is controlled to the dart it's a, a sonar alert uh, network with strategic points and uh, uh, um, uh, to monitor the tectonic uh, plaques that is done to uh, uh, warn people that a tsunami is coming. So the sensors were designed to uh, replace the DART network. 
On the other hand, this posed a geopolitical issue because the ministries of defense in each other countries said, well, if this is a monitoring system, they can then monitor my naval operations, my submarines. But the submarine cables and CTM, CDM is another technology. It's not to be confused with WTM. So in the sub optical field, engineering was developed for aluminum and also for copper submarine cables. So these are generating technologies and new things for the market. And in Latin America, we are facing some challenges in terms of our infrastructure. Many regions are not fully connected. In the case of the submarine cables, we're considering Rio and not the sea. In the north of the country, we have the project RNP is also connected. These are eight waterways, almost four million people. And this is almost an area where there are almost no inhabitants. But this is a Brazilian area that is deficient in terms of infrastructure. We now have two options for this area. And there's another issue that contributed to making Fortaleza what it is today. It is collocation CDS. This is bringing the traffic exchange points or traffic control points near the stations. We have 35. BR points, then the content also became very important. We saw an increase in traffic in Fortaleza. The concept then is that for Latin America and also in the case of our neighbors in Portugal, the idea is to have this also in Valparaíso, in Chile, in Panama, which is happening everywhere. So I was saying the idea for Latin America in the future is to continue promoting investments in submarine cables. This on its own does not solve things, but we need to have long haul networks in order to connect all the submarine cables that are arriving here. So it's not only about private initiatives. This also improves licenses from governments as well as other types of licenses. But the submarine cable or the cable area is something that will continue to grow in order to promote the growth and the infrastructure of every area. We have 15 minutes left. So we now open the floor for questions, both in person or for remote participants. I'm Zhuang. I would like to ask if this is still a strategic uh, uh, policy. Are there any plans or other areas of the Northeast who are not connected? Well, we were praying for anyone not to ask that question. Now, regarding the this process, maybe someone else can answer that question. Well, I can answer that question. But this is not only about if you have a drunken <laughs> sailor. OK, now speaking of Brazil, we have four landing points in Brazil. These are Fortaleza, Praia Grande in Santos, Sao Paulo in Rio de Janeiro, and in Bahia, El Salvador in two beaches. These are the landing points in Brazil. And the future point of landing will be Brazil. In the case of Fortaleza, there is a strong concentration of cables. It is not an anchor point in Brazil. We have other anchor points. We have three, and the fourth is uh, planned. Let me add a technical fact, and this is quite relevant. The cables, the older cables particularly, and speaking about those that are almost 20 years old, have a topology that is somewhat different. If we look at the project of GlobeNet, in practice, this is implemented between Rio de Janeiro and Fortaleza. 
then we have another segment that goes outwards. Now, this is an example. That is a topology, the more modern cables such as Monet and see others that were mentioned. They have a different concept. So the landing is now smarter. It has the WSS included. Now, why am I explaining this? If there is an event, if we have an event in the segment between the branch unit, which is 200 kilometers away from Monet and land, all the traffic between Sao Paulo and Miami wouldn't suffer an impact because Rogerio spoke about having more than one point to link this with the modern technologies compared to the first cable generation that came to Latin America, we managed to figure out a solution. If there is a cut somehow in Monet or the VU in the ocean, then they will follow the express path. So the express path will continue to work. There has been a development in the materials and the deployment that figured out a solution to this problem. Now, regarding the other issue of your question, there are other cities in the Northeast where it would be feasible to do landing. And this reminds me of some of the projects that had considered this. For example, one in Pernambuco, others mentioned landings around the area of San Luis. This is not precisely Northeast, but it's further north. Now, there are issues of legal security, of environmental security along the path, or even the same survey that doesn't solve the problem. Fortaleza, compared to other regions, has a very favorable geography. In the case of Africa, in the on the beach where the walks and the sacks arrive, we have a layer of rocks that is quite big, so because of the friction on it uh, alone, the wire breaks. In Fortaleza, we have sandbanks, which is far more favorable in terms of the structure. So we have to think of all those variables. It's not an impediment, but it is something that leads to favor one place compared to another. Just to add on, this is part of the project. Now, speaking about the diversity of the cities in the northeast of the country. Now, this is part of the Seaborn. Something was done very close to Recife. So the company is interested in connecting to that location. This is meaningful for expanding business in the region. And also another port in order to deliver services. This is an alternative path compared to Fortaleza. Now, to pick up on what Fayo is saying, we have the economic aspect to be considered. There are economic factors to be taken into account. In the past, around the year 2000, all the wires were meaningful because there were not so many land networks. The geography, the Atlantic forest was strongly protected, so it wasn't easy to build networks. So submarine cables were built around all the cities along the coast. Today, we have a land structure of cables all over the country. So this makes it difficult to making this meaningful because there is a capacity that can already be used with less redundancy. And also there is an issue of demand. A submarine cable needs data centers, and the data centers need submarine cables. Fortaleza began as a hub of submarine cables, and now Fortaleza is becoming, becoming a data center hub so that, and so that other cities can be hubs. There has to be consumption. There has to be content. A couple of million dollar investments are required to make these a branch unit. And this will make it sufficiently relevant to become feasible. Good morning, everyone. I'm Dan. I would like to speak as a citizen from Angola. Your presentation showed the importance that all this had for us. A large amount of the traffic in Angola is 
takes place through Fortaleza and when was branched to Google, the Google cable more recently. So all this was most positive because we were not left in the dark. All the things that occurred was almost surreal for the African continent. This was mentioned in the presentation, and mostly for the Western coast. Now, my question is not only my question, but more of my colleagues in Angola who are also participating virtually have a debate regarding the facilities in Sierra, what would the impact be in the future if we organize another event like that that occurred in Angola or in the African region? Okay, let's see. Let me answer as a technical form, and I think it is important to understand that there are technical variables. The impact of a nautical enterprise in this region is not solved from the technical standpoint. Part of the desalinization process is to obtain water from the sea and take it to a treatment plant. Let us imagine that the region along the coast, which we call shallow water, in that region, in order to solve a cut, we use divers. And these divers take the cable because a recovery vessel cannot get close to this cable. Let me give you a technical example of something that wasn't solved yet. So if I need to have a diver and I have a suction rate of about 1 million cubic meters per minute, how can I send someone to a grid that is it's sucking this in through a pipe that is this thick, though there are issues today. We have problems, technical issues, in the context of this project that haven't been solved yet. So this focuses on a somewhat complex situation. So my technical vision is that this project, the way it has been designed with the emissary and the cap unit on the short ending is not feasible for the industry and even for the communications in the region and the country. I'm not speaking on my behalf, but this is because of the data we received for the Latin American region. So this is the macro outlook. Now, specifically in the case of Angola, we are never against implementing projects they're going to provide water supply to a region very far from that. But in order to coexist reasonably, this coexistence has to protect the critical infrastructures. Let me give you a technical example. I was speaking about a technical example. Now, this is a project that is more than 700 pages long and a whole set of variables that haven't been solved. There are issues related to implementation, but these engineering variables haven't been adequately solved. Now, what I can say once again, and from the standpoint of the engineering part, is that most of the countries around the world that use this method to obtain drinking water never deployed this on the short end areas. This was notified designed and validated by ICPC. There's no country in the world that has implemented a desalinization plant on the short end of cables. Good morning. I'm Carlos, and we have questions from remote participants. We see that you're not wearing your headsets. We're going to read out the question in Spanish and Portuguese. I'm going to read the question in Spanish. And my Ms. Nicolas Pereira Molinas is asking, considering that submarine cables are a critical resource for international communications, my questions are, what considerations do you apply in terms of physical security? And secondly, if you have suffered any type of attacks? We're now going to read the question in Portuguese. So they are repeating the same question in 
Portuguese. As I said, over the past three years, there is a strong focus on the policy involving submarine cables. Today's submarine cables are the major tension between United States and China. From 2020 onwards, at least, there have been some intentional cuts or cuts addressed at that between China and Taiwan. For example, the Chinese government has used what they call the fishing militia. In other words, civilian fishing vessels that cut cables in Taiwan. And the same on the north. There are indications of cuts so what I'm saying is publicly available information regarding the security of cables. So there is suspicion of cuts carried out in the context of events such as these. Now, to answer the specific question, cables belong to private companies. So there is a private physical security involved with this. What we have seen in the past two years are countries that develop state policies to physically protect these cables. In the case of Brazil, this includes submarine cables, and this is an issue of public security in Brazil. This is part of the Critical Infrastructure Service, SIC in Portuguese. And many of the countries that are hubs have had have had to adopt physical protection policies and also militarized areas in Brazil for those who does not do not know in 2020 we had a critical event this was a russian vessel this was counter intelligence and this vessel yantar was for 9 days in the exclusive maritime zone of brazil the royal marine from britain warned the brazilian uh, Navy, and this vessel was identified. It was taken by security, and following that, the Brazilian Navy took measures to protect the submarine cables. So maybe the members of the panel would like to add anything. So we do have policies for protecting cables in the countries that are hubs. So submarine cable security is something that involves national security. Well, in that sense, the most delicate part of the wires of the cables is on the landing side. We have to see whether this is allowed by the policies in place. This has to do with environmental issues as well. So this has to provide protection and uh, against anchors, fishing, and other issues in the case of the submarine cables. Unless there is some land movement, this is not an issue. That is why cables are designed along different types of routes. In the transatlantic cable, most of them went on the north of the Atlantic from New York to Britain. And a new route was opened in the mid-Atlantic area that goes from Virginia Beach to Spain and from Virginia Beach to France. And this was very successful as a route because if you have any issues of whatever type in the northern route, you have backup or protection through the mid route. So it's important that not all cables go through the same point on the ocean to avoid situations such as that. Another area are the landing stations. If there is a critical issue on the landing end, then this might also affect the cable. In the landing stations, although two cables might be reaching the same building, these have been designed as if these were, these were two different, different buildings with two power supplies and two different types of infrastructures even if they land in the same site. There are different measures that are adopted. So when you 
my capacity on a cable, there are things that you have to take into account that when you build your network, you have the adequate redundancy. So now let us start wrapping up. On behalf of the submarine cable industry, I would like to thank you for the opportunity of organizing this panel here. Thank you very much once again, and a big round of applause for all the members of the panel.